Good morning. This is Senate Health and Welfare Committee meeting, and it is January 11th, 2023. So welcome, everyone. We're, this morning, our agenda has been sort of changed, and that you have a fresh copy on your desks. We'll we spend just a few minutes talking about uh, committee priorities, so each of you maybe give one or two of your thoughts, and then we'll come back to that discussion at 11 o'clock. We tried to accommodate folks who are have other schedules. So we'll start with that. We'll just dive in and talk about what maybe your major goals are for bills or issues. So just speak to the specific issue and then uh, we'll go from there. We'll come back to this, as I said, at 11 o'clock today, and we'll come back to it regularly during the committee process as we get bills up on the wall. Priorities change, interests change, and we wanna make sure we're staying current. So, Martine, I'm gonna start with you. I mean, Whoa. Senator Bullock. Hot seat, okay. Very, you know, just a brief uh, couple of thoughts about your interests. Well, I am bringing the thoughts that came out of the um, Burlington and Lewski meeting that you were at as well. Um, I, I just thought I would share those because they seem Terrific. really relevant to my constituency and just relevant in general. Um, uh, one of them, and I'm not exactly sure what this would look like, but one that got brought up was specialized care for violent individuals. You mm -hmm. probably remember that. Um, improve access to medication for opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. Contingency management for um, the growing meth use that we see, um, especially in our in our urban areas. Um, Reentry support for justice involved individuals with um, with substance abuse disorder. Mm -hmm. Expanded uh, residential treatment opportunities, including long-term residential treatment for, um, you know, mental health is just a huge part of a lot of what I'm talking about today, and I'm sure it will you be. Are. You are. I mean, you're sort of going yeah. both in and out of the um, public safety realm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, as it pertains to mental health and mm -hmm. um, drug addiction. Um, just a few more. Uh, removing barriers to overdose prevention sites. Um, I'm very interested in shield laws. Mm -hmm. um, reduce and streamline prior approval process with insurance. Oh, so you're talking about prior authorization. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I keep hearing that from our medical professionals. Yeah. And um, I really would like to learn more because I keep hearing about the guardianship issue. Mm -hmm. I would like to learn more about that and I think maybe something that we want to try to fix. It seems like it's got some problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, um, I think there are already some bills that are being drawn up here, so I don't think I'm going to necessarily, but given that we are having this mental health crisis, um, I think we should look at legalizing therapeutic use of psilocybin. I think it is proven to be very helpful to folks suffering from PTSD, especially veterans and um, folks who are retired from the military, as well as uh, reducing anxiety and depression. Um, so those, those are mine. A short list. <laughs> we should be able to tackle all of those in the first, I don't know, Hey, next week, okay. as we can. <laughs> uh, there are some very important issues in there. Thank you. That's a good list. Thank you. Okay, uh, Senator Hardy, do you want to go next? Uh, sure. All right. <laughs> um, well, I, I think I would agree on pretty much everything on Senator Bulett's list. Um, I'm on the opioid settlement um, advisory committee, so I've been working on um, substance use disorder legislation. I have a meeting today actually with Commissioner of Health later um, to try to get, tease out a little bit more about what he's thinking. Um, so I will, I'm working on a couple bills on that that are coming out of the work from that committee. 
Um, and uh, also work we did last year that was vetoed. <laughs> um, I, uh, so that's, that's great to hear that you're interested in that. Um, uh, Senator Lyons and I are working on a protected health care bill, um, which would be um, uh, essentially shield laws, um, both from the health and welfare stance and the judiciary um, perspective. I so we have, 11, we, we have 11 people, our, our, our quota is 10. So I'm going to ask, and if you're sitting in a seat that's labeled staff, I'd like for you to allow for um, Rachel Feldman to please take one of those seats. And then that's good. Now we just, we're right down to quota now. Okay. Oh, good, yeah, thank you. Maybe let Rachel sit there, that'd be great. Okay, sorry for the interruption, Senator. No, you're fine. Okay, uh, good morning, Senator Weeks. Good morning. I'm not sure if you can hear me. We, okay, so we're, we're just going through a short list of priorities. Um, we've got only five more minutes, and then we're going to come back to our priorities at 11 o'clock. Okay, very good. Okay, terrific. So no, that's totally fine. Um, so the protected health care bill, um, which would address um, shield laws from both the health and welfare and the judiciary perspective for um, abortion care and gender affirming care. Um, uh, of course, child care and um, early childhood education that we've been working on for a long time. <laughs> and um, uh, some follow up to some of the work that we did last year on health care reform, um, sort of an oversight, particularly right now with the meltdown of our ACO um, and really trying to get a better handle on uh, the future of the ACO and whether or not it should be a thing. Um, and uh, Ruth, can you share um, any acronyms? With all oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the ACO is the Accountable Care Organization, One Care. Yeah, and um, I'm sure we'll go into more depth about that at some point. <laughs> and um, certainly, mental health. Um, we did some work in mental health last year. Peer, um, peer um, support, support, and uh, work and um, primary care and um, shoring up our primary care. And I will have bills on that as well, so. Um, and and uh, I also am reintroducing the bill that I introduced last year that we never got a chance to get to um, on fertility care. Um, oh, good, so, okay, yeah. right. And I know there's interest in that one too. Yeah, yeah and I, can't remember what else, but those are the things that come to my head right now. <laughs> no, that's, that's helpful. That's yeah. Good. Okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> Senator Williams, um, why don't you give us a thumbnail, and then we will come back to this discussion at eleven o'clock, and when we have our staff here. So, just to give us a start would be helpful. Okay, I can be very brief. Uh, one one concern I've got, I know, is um, Medicare change for retirees. I'd like to know more about that. Okay, good. I've yeah. got a lot of, a lot of uh, feedback from constituents. You're talking about the advantage yes. plan yes. issues? Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Sounds like it's a done deal, but I'd, I'd like to find out if it is. Um, it is not a done deal. It's not, it can't yeah. be a done deal. Okay. Just, I mean, so you, as you talk, well, we can talk about that. Okay. And then going, uh, the guardianship issue, I, I have a bill, I just need to get the legislative council with it. Um, basically, the, there are two different systems. Of, uh, there is voluntary guardianship and involuntary. There are, uh, one, one is in the probate courts and the other one is in the uh, uh, superior court, uh, family court. Mm -hmm. And there are 16 differences between the two. Uh, types of guardianship. So, uh, this has all been being addressed by a constituent who has a concern, and, and it's not just his situation, but it could affect anybody who has a parent or a, a child that could it could apply to. So, um, 
It's an interesting subject to me. Yeah, it is. Very well, you're, you're talking about guardianship, not just of children, but also adults. Correct. So adult protective yes. services. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it? That's good. I mean, that's enough. Mm -hmm. I think we'll find more. That's great. Okay, good. Um, Senator Weeks, would you like to just give us your initial thoughts? Um, Go ahead. Yes, so this is initial thoughts on the um, on your own, on your on your interests and your goals, the issues that you'd like to see covered in here as we work right. together on legislation. Right. Yeah. So, uh, in addition to the ones that we we discussed uh, last week, I would simply like to add the uh, the issue of uh, uh, pervasive obesity. Um, I'm curious uh, if there's anything that the state can do about uh, addressing. Uh, the, the prevalence of obesity in our uh, specifically in our state culture but uh, but that's that's the only new one that I thought of since we um, since we got together last week okay and are there any others that you're specifically I know even bringing in what we talked about last week those issues that you are most concerned about would, would maybe introducing a bill or you would like to get involved with no the reality the reality uh, <laughs> Is that I, I'm not familiar enough with the bill process to be uh, to be in the in the um, uh, to be drafting at this point. That, that's the that's the uncomfortable reality. Okay, well that's just fine. We'll we'll get there, and you'll you'll have fun doing it. Oh. <laughs> okay, good. So everything that you all have talked about are things that I'm interested in and hope that we can work together on. The I just um, is Jenny Samuelson in the hallway. Do we know? She's on Zoom. She's on Zoom. Oh, good. You're here. Okay. So I'll hold off, and um, I can give you a thumbnail when we get to eleven o'clock. But I don't. I do want to make sure that the secretary has sufficient time to share with us the work of the agency, her perspective. Um, so I want to just, how many people have we got in the room? Oh, we're perfect. Okay, good. We're good. Okay. Um, so Secretary Samuelson, welcome to Senate Health and Welfare. It's good to have you here. You're our first official witness. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the record? And our goal here today is to get an understanding of a little bit about the agency and the work that's going on there, and then where you see the greatest challenges for us as we work together during the session. Well, thank you for having me, and it's an, it's an honor to be uh, the person providing first testimony for you this year. Um, it's been exciting to see the energy with having everyone back in the building. Um, and I had been very hopeful uh, to be there uh, this morning, um, but having woken up with a scratchy throat, thought it was prudent um, to, to stay put. So apologies for not, um, for not being in person. Um, again, for the record, I'm Jenny Samuelson. I'm the secretary for the Agency of Human Services and have been for the last year. Um, I've worked with the Agency of Human Services, though, um, for uh, the last 17, almost 18 um, years. So my goal this morning um, is to meet your needs. Please uh, feel free, um, uh, Chair Lyons, to interrupt and, and ask questions or other things as you feel um, fit um, throughout today. I'm going to start off with a general orientation um, to the agency and its departments. Then we'll drop into um, what our priorities are um, for the next year. And it's nice to meet all of you um, who are either new to this committee um, or who are new to the Senate. Um, would, you like, would you like for us to, I would like to have our senators introduce themselves because we have uh, three new folks on the committee. That'd be great. So we're gonna begin on the, on the screen with uh, Senator Weeks. That's your, who you, your, your name and your district. Yes, good morning. Um, I, I certainly understand, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, how you feel about uh, not coming into the room when uh, your, your, your throat's a little scratchy. I'm, I, um, 
I got hit pretty hard with a cold last night, so I'm uh, I'm also uh, remotely linked in. Um, my name is David Weeks, I'm the uh, freshman senator from Rutland County. I live in Proctor. I originally come um, originally come from uh, Wallingford. It's nice to yeah. meet you, and I hope you feel better. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you. Hello, I'm Martine LaRock Gulick. I am a new senator from the Chittenden Central District, and I live in Burlington. Hi, Secretary Samuelson. Nice to see you. Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. Nice to see you again. Morning, Secretary Terry Williams, senator from Rutland, and I'm from Colby. And Jenny Lyons, uh, chair of the committee and from Chittenden Southeast. Getting that straight. <laughs> okay. So, and I, do you have, I'm looking at um, a central office PowerPoint that we have on our webpage, and I'm thinking that, is that what we should be looking at as you're talking? It is. It will give you kind of a, an outline of, of the direction um, that we're going um, today. Would you prefer that if folks either have it on their own computers or um, on hard copies, uh, if that works better for you, or we can, Rachel can share it on the screen. Which works better for you, Chair Lyons? Uh, we have it on our screen. Committee, would you like to have it up on the, on the why don't we put it up on the screen? Uh, and then we can take it down whenever we feel necessary. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Rachel, for putting that out. Okay, and we'll move forward at least a slide. So again, the, the, um, the Agency of Human Services mission is to improve the well-being of Vermonters and to protect uh, the most vulnerable. As you hear that, I want to emphasize that the breadth of our work goes from prevention and wellness, which I heard many of you talking about in terms of your priorities this morning, um, as well as working to support Vermonters who are in oftentimes in crisis. Um, the agency does our work um, by uh, working with a significant number of community organizations and providers to administer a broad range of programs and services um, that promote um, both the well being, as we talked about, of Vermonters and to actually provide direct health care and, and human services programs. Um, the agency really is dedicated to ensuring um, and working with individuals and communities to reach their uh, to reach their potential. And I want to emphasize the last component. While we mount a significant number of programs and services, our goal really is to to help individuals achieve um, a level of independence um, on their own um, as as they move through our programs. You'll note that I wanted to make sure that we touched on the values and the approach to the work. Next slide, Rachel. Uh, the approach to the work that we do, um, because I think it's important um, as we uh, work with you directly this year um, that, that you uh, can see these come forward. There are many good things, um, probably thousands of, of good things that happen at the agencies. Um, and then there are also some really hard things um, that happen through the work at the Agency of Human Services. Um, but our value is really whether we're talking about the positive um, or the challenges and opportunities is to strive towards transparency and to do our work um, with integrity. Um, we really have a strong focus on service, um, both for the individuals that we serve, but also um, service for um, the staff and other and other people across our agency, because many of our um, many of our staff um, work internally as well as externally. So these should really come forward um, as we um, do our work together um, with the legislature. The Agency of Human Services is also approaches our work with innovation, not just change for change's sake, but recognizing that over time, the needs of our communities and the needs of individuals um, are evolving. And so we're co continuously looking for ways to ensure that we are um, looking for best practices and looking for new opportunities um, to serve people and to serve them well. Um, 
throughout the pandemic, uh, you have seen, or I have seen, and I'm hoping that you also have seen the ability for us to come together and do teamwork. Um, the Agency of Human Services is often um, talked about as having multiple silos because we are such a large um, agency. Um, but what we saw during the pandemic is departments working um, closely together across organizational boundaries um, and also closely, more closely together with our community partners and with other agencies in state government. And so that's a true approach that we're that we're working to hold on to and amplify. Many of the staff that we have across the agency could be doing work in other places that was less stressful or more lucrative for them, but they come to work with the Agency of Human Services every day because they're really dedicated um, to serving Vermonters and serving Vermont communities. And it's been a privilege to work with probably the most dedicated staff um, that I've ever worked with um, in, my, in my career and in my life. So, for a general orientation, I know that we've got a mixed group, some folks who have um, either worked on this committee before um, or who are new to or, or new to the legislature. So next slide, Rachel. Um, I want to do a, a general introduction. Um, we are the largest agency in state government with a total budget of a little over $4.7 um, billion in terms of our appropriation. That is a significant mix across different fund sources, federal and state fund sources. Um, uh, uh, we also have over 3,700 employees to carry out our work across our six departments and a couple of offices within the, the Secretary's Office of the Agency of Human Services. We do this work through six departments, um, and I'm gonna go through each one of the departments and the general size and the mission um, of each. Um, but I do wanna point out that uh, we recognize that the, that oftentimes individuals um, will end up at our highest level of acuity in hospitals and our correctional facilities or, and or through homelessness, but that the root causes of why they get there really are, um, are held within the, the jurisdiction of each of the departments within the Agency of Human Services. And so we really are set up by working across our, our boundaries to um, address mental health, substance use, trauma, violence, food insecurity, and housing instability that really, um, as we look further upstream, prevent um, these outward um, high acuity and, and, and expensive levels of care that cause trauma for Vermonters. So across those departments, we'll start with the Department for Public Health. Um, it's the Vermont Department of Health. You'll often hear it referred to as VDH. Um, it is our public health entity in Vermont, as you've seen over the last two years. They have uh, a little over 650 employees with a, a focus on protection and improving the health of Vermonters. They do this through partnerships with schools, businesses, and communities. Um, and the activities that they generally carry out include surveillance, education, promotion of healthy lifestyles, activities to prevent, detect, and respond to disease and injury from environmental factors and infectious disease. So they've got, they've got a significant breadth across um, the prevention um, spectrum, but also um, on that early detection um, and, react and reaction. Moving forward to our Department for Mental Health, which you will hear sometimes referred to as DMH. Um, they have uh, um, nearly 300 employees um, and they're um, really uh, targeted to, to provide access to effective preventive and early um, intervention and mental health um, treatment and support to those who need, need it so that they can live, work, learn and participate um, fully in their communities. They do this through a range of services from prevention activities to community mental health services for people who need mental health supports, crisis supports and response to intensive residential treatment programs, and then secure residential and inpatient hospital and inpatient hospitals. In order to do this work, they oversee the work of the designated and specialized services agencies in our communities. They also run Vermont's psychiatric hospital, which you will hear um, um, often referred to as VPCH, and a therapeutic, um, a secure therapeutic residence, um, which at this point is in Middlesex, but will be moving, um, will be moving shortly to the Chittenden County area um, in a permanent space uh, in April. Um, 
I want to note that they are because of their work at VPCH and their therapeutic residence, and that they um, that they take direct custody of those who are in, in involuntary care, that this is one of our custodial departments. In addition to the work that we've talked about already, they have a range of partnership with other organizations and nonprofits from hospitals to residential care um, to the crisis hotline in order to carry out their direct mission. Rachel, can you move forward to, uh, um, no, actually no, stay on this side, please. The next department is the, the Department for Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. Um, they have approximately 320 employees. Um, the focus of Dale is to make Vermont the best place uh, in which to grow old or to live with a disability with dignity, respect, and independence. Um, they do this by providing adult services um, such as Choices for Care, which is a community, which are a set of community-based services um, that prevent individuals from needing skilled nursing levels of care through adult protective services and adult day. They also support care for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, they provide supports for individuals who are blind and visually impaired, and they provide licensing of long-term care and residential facilities and support to individuals who may have disabilities and need employment, um, which is a really exciting preventive program, often, uh, which you will hear often referred to as Higher Ability Vermont. Like the, the Department for Mental Health, the Department for Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living partners very closely with the designated and specialized services agencies. So you'll often hear um, the uh, Department of Mental Health and Department for Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living referred to when, when we're talking about the DAs or the designated agencies. They work with long-term care facilities and the area agencies on aging along with many other organizations to carry out their mission. The next department is the Department for Children and Families. They are one of the largest um, departments within state government. They have um, almost a thousand employees. Um, they're focused on the health and well being of children and families across Vermont. Um, what folks don't often connect to them with them is that they also um, administer many of our economic. Um, services and supports, um, and that they are the ones who um, provide support for early education through, the through their child development division. In order to do their work, um, the, typically folks are familiar with their child protective services work, but they also administer three squares, fuel assistance, emergency housing, known as the general housing assistance program, or sometimes referred to as the hotel voucher programs, they support shelters and local offices of economic opportunity. They determine eligibility for disability services. Um, they administer programs for child support. They do licensing for child care programs. And they determine eligibility and administer the child care subsidy programs. Moving, moving forward to the Department for Vermont Health Access, um, they have about 374 employees. Their mission is to prove Vermonters health and well-being by providing them with access to high quality, um, uh, high quality and cost-effective health care. When most people hear the Department of Vermont Health Access, they think of DIVA and their role with the Medicaid program, but I want to pause there um, to note the role that Dale, the Department for Mental Health, and the Department for Disabilities, uh, Department for um, Disabilities, eight, uh, sorry, dis the Department for Children and Families, um, that they each oversee uh, specific components of the Medicaid program themselves. As a, as a whole agency, the agency is the Medicaid administrator. That said, DIVA plays a prominent role in the health insurance in Vermont. They help Vermonters access health insurance by determining eligibility and enrollment for Medicaid. They also run Vermont Health Connect, um, which is a place often referred to as a marketplace um, for individuals and businesses to purchase and acquire commercial insurance. Um, they set rates and play um, and pay healthcare providers for healthcare services for the Medicaid program. And they also are, are driving some of the, much of the innovation in payment models and incentivize value versus volume in healthcare. So our last department is our corrections department. It has, it has a little over a thousand employees and is the largest department um, in the Agency of Human Services. Um, I wanna note um, that it is unique 
um, uh, to have a uh, Department of Corrections within the, an agency of human services. And this really speaks to Vermont's commitment for identifying the health and human services needs that often leads, lead to incarceration, such as mental health, substance use, and trauma. Um, and as such, working to address those needs for individuals who are coming into, um, into custodial care and or community care through the Department of Corrections, really taking a therapeutic um, approach and a rehabilitative approach in the state of Vermont. And I appreciate that. Um, that commitment. The Vermont Department of Correction is committed to addressing these issues um, for those who are incarcerated or who are on probation and parole with a goal that through the services and support that they provide, individuals will achieve independence and will not return um, to our correctional system. And Vermont stands out in that way. Um, by being embedded in the Agency of Human Services, it provides them with a unique opportunity to partner um, with other um, departments across the agency to ensure continuity in the provision of services. Um, they serve about 1,300 people who are incarcerated in six correctional um, facilities in Vermont. And it's worth noting that we don't have a jail system. We have a correctional system um, in, in the state and that is embedded within our correctional facilities. In addition to that, there are uh, there are 5,700 um, people, a, pro a little more than that, who are supervised in communities through probation um, and parole. So those are our six departments. Um, in addition to those six departments, um, the, it's worth noting that, um, among other things, the Office of Healthcare Reform um, is embedded within uh, the, the Secretary's Office at the Agency of Human Services. Um, I heard you talking before about the Accountable Care Organization. Um, and it really, it really is the, the role of the Office of Healthcare Reform to set the vision, direction, and policy um, relate, related to healthcare reform, including how we evolve the way that we care, and then in support of that, the way that we pay. Um, and the Office of Healthcare Reform takes a lead role in negotiating um, both with um, Medicaid and with Medicare at the federal level, um, the agreements and waivers that help them participate in Vermont's healthcare reform and also to set the, to set the direction. Um, they, uh, as we look at where we are right now coming out of the pandemic, um, the Office of Healthcare for Reform is really focused on two things, providing um, provider stability and long-term sustainability for our healthcare system. In order to make that achievable and doable, they really are focused into four key areas right now, including um, integration of mental health and substance use um, into, uh, into our systems of care and integration with each other, um, looking at long-term care um, or what others re also refer to as skilled care, which includes our skilled nursing facilities and home health agencies, um, primary care, and then working with our, and, and working in those two areas also with our hospitals, recognizing the important role that our hospitals play in the health and economic viability of our communities. And so there's been a lot of focus and a lot of work um, across agencies and um, within state government, but also with our healthcare providers to really focus on the stability and long-term sustainability of at least these four elements of our healthcare system. So I'm gonna pause there, um, Chair Lyons, to see if there's anything, um, any questions that you or committee members have um, and um, also uh, kind of take a moment to take a breath before we head into our priorities that we have for the next year. Any, any uh, burning questions, committee? I think we're good. It's been very clear and helpful. So Great. why don't you go right ahead into priorities. Uh, I think you've got about seven or eight minutes left and it would be helpful for us to understand uh, what your priorities are and how they might dovetail with our thinking in here. Great. We'll, we'll sort that out as time goes on. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I've, I look forward to continuing to work with this committee on that. So I, I do want to point out as we go into, um, into our priorities that the Agency of Human Services, while we play many roles, um, it's important to point out two particular roles. Um, the Agency of Human Services is the Medicaid agency. So that's the public um, insurance program for um, Vermonters who um, 
may be, have low income or a disability. Um, and by doing that, we determine um, eligibility, we ensure payments and the provision of care for services for individuals who are enrolled in Medicaid. Across the entirety of the agency, and this should be a theme that you, and, and the Medicaid agency, it means that multiple of our departments are involved in administering the Medicaid programs and services. In addition to that, uh, Medicaid role, we also have a population health and human services role, really to assess and monitor um, the needs, uh, uh, the health and the needs of Vermonters, um, and to make sure that those that the systems who provide those services and support um, are appropriately um, appropriately uh, sized and um, and resourced, as well as um, making sure that those services are available to Vermonters. Um, it, I want to reinforce the AHS facilitates these uh, the second rules through um, a significant number of investments in private nonprofit health and human services organizations, um, and we often do not directly provide some of the the services our, uh, in ourselves. We do we definitely determine eligibility and enrollment, um, and provide uh, case management. So when I look at our priorities um, for the next, uh, the next uh, year um, and in this session, while we've got many priorities, I want to point out three. Um, it re we're really working on strengthening and integrating the system of care for mental health and substance use disorder. I want to point out the two components of that, um, really strengthening. So looking at the gaps, um, which you'll see uh, and can see in some identified in some of our proposals for MOPE, um, proposals and RFPs for mobile crisis, alternative to emergency departments and implementation of things like the crisis um, call line. So real focus on making sure that we've got the right foundation across that whole system of care and also recognizing the interplay between mental health and substance use and ensuring that that's a co-occurring system of care. The second is making sure that the health and human services works for individuals who are at highest need what we recognize is that many of the, of the people we serve come to us at a crisis point in their lives. They're enrolling in multiple services at the same time. And that there's a lot that we can do to um, ease the burden on, on individuals who are inter interacting with our system, particularly given the federal pressures that we have related to data and other things that we collect. In this area, you will see us working on um, both the flow within the agency of human services through that collaboration partnership that I talked about earlier, but also through IT projects like integrated eligibility and, and enrollment and continuing to move forward um, with, uh, with that vision um, and direction. And so really looking at how we can also financially braid and blend funds so that that's not necessarily apparent to the client, but um, so that we can adequately um, support them and their needs. Um, we also are looking to stabilize the health and human services system um, and do that with um, responsibility financially in a financially responsible way. Um, uh, following the pandemic, um, we are continuing um, to pursue our long-term um, healthcare reform goals. And so in this area, what you will see is, is that there's a lot of um, workforce pressures on many of our, uh, our the systems within the, in the, um, in the agency. We've been providing uh, extraordinary financial relief. And we're beginning to look at with providers at how we might do uh, shore up components of the system or do our work differently, um, given the fact that the demographic trends and others will continue to put pressures on, on our systems for years to come. And that also we need to make sure that we are um, that we continue to, to achieve our affordability goals for Vermonters for the services that that they're enrolled in. So, in addition to our in addition to our priorities, there are some key pressures um, that you will see um, affecting the Agency of Human Services this year. Those include um, the, the updating the system of care plan um, and uh, continuing to provide innovation in the space for, for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, as with many of our other systems, we're seeing um, a higher level of acuity and need coming into our developmental um, services system. Um, and as such, we're needing to assess um, and reevaluate the programs that are nece necessary. Um, the system of care plan will be um, provided um, or has been provided uh, that provides some updates, but we also know that we need to look at our crisis system of care and some other innovations. We also are finding facility pressures. Um, we have, as folks have heard, our women's correctional facility, looking at where that will be cited 
in place. Our high-end um, system of care for, for youth um, is experiencing significant um, pressures um, and significantly higher acuity than we have experienced before. And so looking at, at, at looking at where we might provide services to both um, provide immediate stabilization and treatment um, for um, youth who are in, in crisis. And then lastly, um, as we uh, in the facilities area, um, we have seen an increase in the number of individuals who are adjudicated um, in, the, in the criminal justice system um, and uh, need a hospital or a, um, or a residential level of care and support um, as they're incompetent um, to, to stand trial and to really work towards competency. Um, while I know that many folks may or may, or may not um, be uh, affiliated with this term, um, you'll often hear this referred to as looking really at our forensic system of care. And then lastly, housing. We've seen um, historic investments in permanent housing and housing opportunities um, across the state of Vermont um, over the last year. But we also see a significant need um, in terms of emergency housing needs um, and, and returning to a system where people get this, the care and support that they need um, if they are experiencing um, housing instability. And so really working with community partners to look at how we evolve from what our pandemic related position has been um, to something that is a, a more permanent um, solution that better serves um, Vermonters. And so those are, those are some of our key pressures. Generally, um, I hear uh, individuals ask when to contact the, the secretary's office or when to contact departments. Um, and, I, and I think that here are some basic, um, some basic groundings. Um, we have constituent services um, for individuals, particularly who are having a hard time across multiple different departments um, and or navigating services. Um, re please reach out to the central office for that. Um, we take press and communication inquiries that may also be pertinent to issues and cross departments. The blueprint for health um, and healthcare reform um, sit at the secretary's office, as do does our, refu our office of refugee um, health and research. Settlement. And so inquiries related to that should come to the central office. And then oftentimes there's multi-department inquiries. You know, where do we start? You're a large agency. Um, individuals are complex. They or issues are complex. They cross they cross department boundaries. That's a that's a time to come and talk to the agency of human services centrally. And then um, the Agency of Human Services does our budget um, that we have across the entire agency. It's not departments, we try to look at it not as department specific budgets, but how we support the health and human services needs. And so agency wide budget questions should come centrally to our, our um, chief financial officer. Um, and then he has liaisons within each department who help administer the funds um, across those um, programs. So that's when to contact us centrally. And um, if you're trying to get a response immediately right away, um, Shayla Livingston, who's our, our policy director, um, and Ashley Roy, who is our administrative coordinator, and then you have Rachel in the room, are great contacts who, can, who often provide immediate um, response um, to questions and queries. I'm always happy to take them myself, but sometimes um, it may take me a day or so um, to get back, whereas Shayla, Ashley, and Rachel really catch things um, on an, an, in an immediate way. Um, so that's the agency overview for the Agency of Human Services in a nutshell. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, um, Chair Lyons, to see if you've got any additional questions or inquiries. Uh, thank you. That has been a really terrific overview. And uh, even for those of us who are experienced in this area, it was helpful to hear that and some of the nuance that you brought. So thank you. And thank you for staying within the time. It's terrific. Really appreciate it. Yes. So I'm, I know I know that we're, there may be questions that I'm going to ask the committee uh, if you have a, a burning question for the secretary could ask it now, otherwise we can move on to uh, hear from Dr. Levine and the Department of Health. But do you have any specific questions? I just, Ruth, go ahead. Um, and they, uh, Senator Weeks, do you have a question? Yes, no, okay. Go ahead, Senator Hardy. Thanks, Chair Lyons. Um, Madam Secretary, uh, you and I talked last week about the, um, the unwinding of the public health 
emergency at the federal level and the impact that may, that will have on the Medicaid program. And I'm just wondering if you've been able to get any information on that. Um, this is maybe just a reminder if you need to come back to us with that information. <laughs> Yeah, no, and we can we can dig that into more detail for the other committee members. Um, what what we know now is that at the public health emergency has been linked to um, a hold on redeterminations for Medicaid, which means that the Medicaid caseload or the number of individuals enrolled in Medicaid is higher than it's ever been because no one during this the last two years has been it been redetermined at whether they're continue to be eligible. Um, it is continues to be my understanding, um, Senator Hardy, that um, in April that that had been linked to the public health emergency and that we would not start redeterminations. It is still my understanding that in April they have they have separated those two things out, um, that regardless of whether the public health emergency continues, they will be able to to. Um, to continue to begin redeterminations. Um, that will have a significant impact on, on many Vermonters, but also the workload at the Department for Vermont Health Access. If for any reason we we I um, come back and and we determine that that's not the case and we're not and we're gonna need to hold on um, on redeterminations, I'll let you know. Okay. I think it's mostly just what resources you may or may not need in order yeah. to do all the redeterminations and making yeah. sure people aren't falling through the cracks with that yeah. process. Yeah, what we what we have done is that the Department for Vermont Health Access feels at this point um, that they have the that they, they've measured out the redeterminations over the period of time that the federal government will allow them to do in a way that is achievable through the department and achievable by asking other um, staff and employees and other departments to assist. And so right now they're feeling like they've got an achievable plan, but they'll know more about that when they begin the process to see whether they can keep on track with their current status and plan. I mean, it is a great question. If you, it sounds like you have Dr. Levine coming in um, from our Department of Health next. I'm sure that some point during the, during the year, you'll probably have, um, Department of Vermont Health Access, but I will have Andrea reach directly out to you, um, Commissioner DeLabrio. Great. Thank yeah, you. thank you. No, we will get to having a more direct and uh, specific conversation in particular about the, the, the results of the pandemic and the effects on not just DIVA, but other, other parts of the agency. You know, thank you. Um, Senator Larak Rulick. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Secretary, for that presentation. That was great. Um, this also might be a question that we can delve into uh, at another date, just because it may be kind of a big one. But I am curious about the need for a women's correctional facility, um, why there is a need or a perception of a need, and also if um, there's a plan for that facility to be publicly held or privately. Um, so if we could talk about that at some point, that'd be great. Yeah. Those are two easy questions to, to answer. So what, if it's okay with you, Chair Lyons, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a, take a half a minute. Go right ahead. Okay. So um, our correctional facilities in Vermont are um, public facilities. They are run by and staffed by the Department of Corrections, and that will be true of the women's facility. Um, right now, um, our women's facility is in Chittenden County, and the infrastructure for that is aging um, and uh that while they have looked at what it would take to um, address the needs, for example, some sewer and other related issues, it would be more it would be more expensive to do that at their current location than to build a state of, um, a more state of the art facility. Thank you. That that really helps to facilitate both incarceration and that gives them a, a tr an opportunity to have tra a community transitions approach, which is um, a state-of-the-art approach. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your time and uh, this has been very clear and I know that we'll be seeing bills that relate to some of the priorities that you've expressed. Uh, I, know I haven't set, set, named my priorities, but one of them is blueprint and, and also mental health and substance use disorder and trying to integrate those co-occurring disorders into the programs that we have. So I look forward to having you back in or others back in to, as we discuss that. Thank you. It's, it's been a delight. Have a great day, everyone. You as well.
Thank you. Take care. Dr. Levine, welcome. Hello, Senator Lawrence. So, you know, we, we, we're, we have a new committee. I see. I, I think everyone is probably knows who you are, but you don't know who we all are. So we're going to go around the room yet again, and we're going to begin on the screen behind you. And um, go ahead. Yes, good morning, doctor. My name is David Weeks. I'm the, uh, the uh, Rutland County Senator, uh, and I uh, come from Proctor. Great. Nice to meet you. Good morning. I'm Martine Laraculic. I live in Burlington, and I'm the new, one of the new senators from Chittenden Central District. You know me, Ruth Hardy, from Addison <laughs> District. Senator Terry Williams from Rutland District, and I live in Polk. I'm surrounded by Rutland. This is what yes. happens. You know, we're surrounded by Rutland. <laughs> <laughs> and I also know you, so it's welcome. It's great to have you back um, and have you here. Uh, we're interested in just getting to know about the Department of Health. Um, some of us are more familiar than others, but and we have a PowerPoint. Do you want? Are you going to go oh, through that? Yeah, we have the Department of Health PowerPoint. Yeah. So the way it was described to me, I could come back for yeah. a broader presentation. Yes. Um, and that's really the broader presentation. This is the broader, okay. Um, but I also want to kind of satisfy your needs for today. Good. Um, we we really want to get our feet wet that. and and really yeah. understand okay. the Department of Health and where the priorities are currently, of Good. the work that you're doing and how we might be working together going forward. I know we're going to see bills on prevention, intervention, treatment, um, yes. et cetera. So. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, because there are actually more new members than old members, um, I think we'll start sort of at the beginning. Because I think one of the most uh, common, if you will, areas that uh, people confuse and conflate is health care mm -hmm. with health. Uh, so, I always try to begin with sort of understanding what health and the mission of public health are, because that's very different. I also want you to understand um, that the work of public health is broad and that we have a very uh, passionate and skilled uh, and professional workforce uh, to carry out much of that. Never enough, but still. And third, uh, I guess, take home message, if you will, would be that to work effectively, public health has to really work across sectors. Uh, we don't do all of the work of public health. It's really through partnerships and collaborations with legislators and governors, but also with all of the sectors of society, essentially. And that's where things like health and all policies becomes very important because uh, to have a healthy community, one requires interaction with agency of commerce and community development. Agency of Transportation, Agency of Agriculture, uh, the list goes on and on and on. So those are sort of sort of themes and take-home messages. The other take-home message is COVID is not our only business. Um, though it seems to never go away, it's still not uh, at the level where uh, we can't do other work. And that's really, I think, what we've arrived at of late. Um, when it comes to, um, I'll, I'll say a few things from the slides just um, to, to get us all on the same page. Um, and then we can uh, get into some of the priorities. But basically the definition of health is really meant to be a definition that takes you off of the course of disease and illness. Uh, as a doctor, I try to deal with all of them, but at the same time, public health is really far more focused on the prevention theme, far more focused on mental, social, um, physical well-being uh, as the state that we want to achieve. And that's really important. In public health, um, our, to me, our mission statement is really like the reason to get up every morning and go to work. You know, to protect and promote the best health of all Vermonters. Um, and so that's what we try to do. 
um, which is not an easy task when you think about the spectrum and intensity of public health problems across the country, never mind uh, in our little state. So, so I think that's a really important thing. The traditional definition of public health really focuses on uh, preventing outbreaks and epidemics, uh, working on environmental hazards, and trying to have healthy lifestyle choices to prevent chronic diseases, which, as you know, occupy the biggest part of a healthcare budget. Um, the more modern definition doesn't ignore those, it encompasses those, but it also includes really working across sectors to achieve these common goals and uh, have healthy communities uh, throughout. And, and that's a, a broader definition, which I think is very useful to, to keep in the back of your mind. So with that as sort of the framework, the, the structure of the Department of Health has uh, a number of divisions in it, some of which evoke the, the words I just used in the definition. So we have laboratory science and infectious diseases. Needless to say, uh, that was intense during the pandemic, but there are plenty of infectious diseases to keep <laughs> them busy, even if there were no respiratory viruses in the world. And there's plenty of laboratory work that's not all infectious, much of it is environmental and in other sp spheres uh, to keep our public health lab busy as well. Uh, but needless to say, uh, the immunization section is under that, uh, and there are more immunizations than just the bivalent vaccine for COVID. We also have an environmental health section, um, and this committee and others work very closely with that and us to achieve what we've achieved with school led uh, in the drinking water testing. They're also concerned about things like cyanobacteria, PFOA, PCBs at the, the schools, et cetera. Uh, we also have a section of health promotion and disease prevention, which I described earlier as how do we have healthier lifestyles, prevent chronic diseases, or uh, enhance self-management of prevention of chronic diseases uh, to have a healthier society. Opioids are always a big issue, so we have an entire division of substance use programs but opioids is not their only business. Their business is very broad, and um, we would not want to forget the impact of alcohol in our state. We would not want to forget the fact that um, teenage and middle school brains get affected by a host of substances on the way to some of the very bad things, not the least of which is nicotine, uh, cannabis, alcohol sort of the big three. We also have a um, section on maternal child health. And maternal child health is exactly what it says. It's trying to keep that family structure as strong as possible in Vermont. From a physical health standpoint, from a mental and emotional health standpoint, from a substance use standpoint, from all of the things that cause what we call ACEs, adverse childhood experiences that uh, conspire in the very earliest parts of life to really set a child on its destiny, if you will. And the goal is that destiny be bright and uh, wonderful and not uh, severely restricted by some of the events of uh, early years. So a lot of our work there goes on from very early life, uh, prenatal, just after birth, to middle school to high school, um, and to, again, involving the mother and family, whether it's breastfeeding issues or what have you. You'll be happy to know that we have a proud new grandfather sitting in this room. Ah, so I know the feeling. Hit a good note. <laughs> good. Yeah. The um, other divisions um, would involve um, the newest one, which is health equity. And everything we do in the department is on a platform or a foundation of health equity, because health equity is so critical. Um, the definition, if you will, is everyone should have the same fair and just opportunity to be healthy. 
And when we look at health data, which our department is all about, and we have an entire division called Health Statistics and Informatics, the data says that many Vermonters are doing just fine. But when you start to look at who the Vermonters are that aren't, you find that there are areas where there are severe inequities. They generally fall along lines of uh, race, uh, gender and sexual orientation, uh, disability status, socioeconomic status. And a little bit in Vermont on rural versus, I hate to say urban, but rural status. Uh, so these are all really, really critical things. So that's kind of how our department is structured. And I'm sure uh, we could talk for a long time on priorities. Um, and and, I, I, and, and I'll, I'll, I can do that when I come back, or we can start it today. Well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that it would be helpful, yeah, I think, to have to you come back. Because I know yeah. there are a lot of questions that we want to dive into. Um, yes. And my particular interest will be to come back and have a discussion initially on prevention. Uh, and the prevention council that's in place, uh, the chief prevention officer, yes. the, all the work that's been Good. going on for the past several years, and then how that intersects with the um, opioid uh, uh, substance use advisory committee that Senator Hardy is on, and how yes. what recommendations we might be see uh, see Good. coming from there, um, and then uh, so yes, there's a lot just in that area, right. and Senator uh, Weeks pointed out his interest in obesity, which is one of those Good. problems that we see, particularly mm -hmm. in adolescents, that some of us have been trying to work on prevention for too many years, and um, yes. yeah, so what progress, if any, can we make? Adolescent issues are particularly, um, have been really exacerbated during COVID as well as others. So, you've, took, you've taken all the words out of we, my mouth that well, I would have come we, up with. We can uh, go, we, we, we would love to have you come back. And I think yeah. that you know that's just the tip of an iceberg, right? So right, and there are, there are some of those that are higher priorities than other, but they are sure. all priorities. They're all priorities. Uh, and post pandemic, they have become even more of a priority because lots suffered during the course of the pandemic. I'm happy to give you a COVID update at that time as well. Good, uh, we'll do that. Just to put the perspective, but good to see that you've restricted the uh, admission to the room uh, <laughs> because it is a tight room yeah. uh, for sure. And wearing masks when you feel that's appropriate is fully endorsed. Well, so. we're the Health and Welfare Committee, so we try to be <laughs> I know. somewhat cautious. <laughs> I am with you, believe me. That's uh, good. But yeah, so I mean, Good. We'll Pre pre prevention was the theme you raised, and, and that's it. Whether it's chronic disease, whether it's substance misuse, whether it's the development of a youth brain from nicotine to onward to opioids and uh, stimulants. ACEs. Whether it's social determinants. Right. Yeah. And whether it's early childhood programming that will actually set the mother child or family child dyad in a better direction from the very earliest days. Uh, all of those things are very high on our priority spectrum. And though it may not show up as much, obesity and childhood obesity being such critical problems, less in Vermont than elsewhere, but our trajectories are still all the same. Um, that's uh, something we have to tackle in the midst of everything else. And I know you have mental health coming in on my tail, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want this committee to think that we are divorced from mental health. They, yeah. That's their turf. Um, they have enough to do, by the way, uh, in <laughs> mental health. But the whole issue of integration of mental health is a council that I'm chairing with uh, the deputy commissioner for DMH. The whole issue of how mental health and substance use disorders get addressed, uh, isolated versus uh, comprehensively. All of these are, are really big issues that our department is working on with them. Suicide prevention being the other really hard statistic compared along with opioid overdoses. These are the realities, so they are all on the priority and, and just to say, um, we, uh, we, will, we will have you back, and um, the whole area of prevention is so difficult for people to understand when you look at appropriations and revenue. Yes. Because 
the the longer term goals. You know, so you don't see the results for many years, but it's so critical. Right, but bravo to the last session where yes. the governor and legislature got together and $3 million appeared for really prevention coalitions around the state uh, mm -hmm. to have more <laughs> equity in that arena than yep. we've had. That is a longer term strategy, but caution you to realize that some of the returns occur within a couple of years. Yeah. So it doesn't mean you have to wait a decade every time you do a prevention program. So good. I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that we move on to mental health. Yep. I know that there are about a million questions mm -hmm. sitting around this table mm -hmm. and on the screen, uh, but we look mm -hmm. forward to having you back. And maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, what you see as the as the topics that you'd like to That'd be great. present. I know yeah. we're going to have bills. We're going to see the we're going to see the tobacco bill back again and so on. So we'll know we'll hear that. We're going to have substance use disorder, mental health. So yeah. but we'll we'll work together as much as we can. To, Great. Well, thank you for having me today. We greatly um, appreciate your time. I'm sure most of you, but maybe not all of you, know David Englander, who's the senior policy and legal counsel for our department. Um, and uh, we'll so David will not be a stranger. I'm afraid not. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I know. All guys in advance. No, it's great. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Sure. I have to extend this. Okay. Yep. That's fine. And thank you for, you know, just thank you for your work. Yeah. Just before you leave. Oops, he didn't hear me. That's okay. But I wanted to say thank you to, for Dr. Levine for the work he's done. We're going to take a five minute break. Okay. We're going to be 15 minutes behind, then it comes out of our hide. We don't have to. Okay. Welcome back. This is the Health and Welfare Committee meeting of. January 11th. So we are meeting today with members of the Agency of Human Services and we have with us um, the Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner of Department of Mental Health. So why don't you, um, before you introduce yourselves, I'm going to have the committee introduced because we have uh, three new members Great. and we're going to start on the screen behind you. Mm -hmm. Hey, good morning, all. Uh, this is Dave Weeks, uh, Senator from Rutland County. Uh, I hail from uh, Proctor. Good morning. Senator Bullock. Hello, I am Martine Bullock. I live in Burlington, and I am a new senator in Chicken Central. Oh, oh, great. Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Terry Williams, uh, Senator from Rutland County. I live in Paul. Oh, great. Nice to meet you. So I'm when when Senator Weeks is here, I'm surrounded by Rutland. <laughs> I'm not going to let him forget it. Um, Senator Hardy will be back in. She went out to uh, have a chat with Dr. Levine, I think. Okay. So why don't you introduce yourselves for the record and then give us uh, a, you know an overview of DMH and maybe some of the priorities that you have and how we might be working together going forward. Sure. Good. Um, so good morning for the record, Emily Haas, Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. And for the record, Allison Crump, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Perfect. And we have a PowerPoint that eventually Nicole is, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Oh yeah, so my name is, um, for the record, my name is Nicole Stasio. I am the Director of Policy for the Department of Mental Health. Terrific. I, I'm disabled from screen sharing, so I keep kind of out. <laughs> okay, so once we get that, but we do have your PowerPoint here, so oh, great. You know, go right ahead. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I'll start off just framing out the, the mission and vision for the Department of Mental Health. Um, so the, the mission is to promote and improve the health of Vermonters um, and the department resides under the Agency of Human Services and has the same critical mission uh, which is to improve the conditions and well-being of Vermonters and protect uh, those who cannot protect themselves. Our vision um, is that mental health will be a cornerstone of health in Vermont. People uh, will live in caring communities with compassion for and determination uh, to respond effectively and respectively to uh, mental health needs of all citizens. Uh, we also um, want Vermonters um, and they will have access to effective prevention, early intervention, um, and mental health treatment and supports as needed to live, work, 
learn and participate fully in their communities. Uh, so I'll run through a few of the things that, that DMH focuses on. Um, so we're responsible through statute for the mental health system of care. Um, as a department, we're comprised of uh, around 265 staff. Um, 200 of those uh, folks are uh, within our facilities, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital and currently Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residents. Uh, the DMH budget uh, operates around uh, $287 million um, to support the mental health services to over 25,000 Vermonters. Additionally, we oversee the 10 designated agencies, um, as well as two specialized service agencies. Um, I'll highlight quickly for you all the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. That is a 25 bed adult facility located in Berlin, the top of the hill. Um, folks uh, there are under the care and custody of the commissioner. Can I, can I ask you very quickly, sure. how difficult would it be for this committee to uh, take a field trip to that facility. We love field trips. That sounds great. We'll uh, coordinate that with Alex, uh, with yeah. Alex and, and the BPCH team. Excellent. Um, so we're happy to do that. Um, currently, we also have the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence that is in Middlesex. Um, for folks to be aware, we are in the process of uh, moving that program to Essex. That's the other one we want to visit. Yep, that's uh, the new name will be River Valley Therapeutic Community Residence. Yep. Um, for folks who aren't aware, Middlesex was um, one of the response efforts of the state from Tropical Storm Irene, um, and it was a temporary facility. And so we're moving into a permanent facility and expanding that program. Um, and it is the, the state's only uh, secure residential. Um, additionally, we, we manage several contracts and grants to peer organizations. Uh, we have uh, contracts for forensic psychiatry. Um, we do psychiatric consultation with primary care, um, and then also a VCHIP contract to conduct analysis of population uh, level data related uh, to mental health. That's a small, those are a small sample of contracts. We have many, many grants and contracts to support uh, Vermonters. Um, additionally, we partner with uh, local hospitals, our community providers, uh, police departments, uh, courts, and pretty much anybody you can think of, um, we're, we're partnering with them. Um, let's see. It was hard to know if you went through those different points behind me, did you? I did. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's going yeah. great. Great. All right. I'll take it. Um, so I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Croft to uh, summarize this slide. So I think when it comes to what our priorities are and how we're talking about um, how we're identifying gaps in the system and the vision we have for where we want to go, we're putting things into the category of someone to prevent someone to call, someone to respond, and somewhere to go. And so at the department, we've, over the past couple of years, we're, we've been trying to build up the somewhere to prevent. You'll see that in the resiliency and trauma prevention position that was um, provided to Agency of Human Services, but is situated at DMH. That position has been, we've just been so lucky to see how well it's gone and they are really well respected and valued but serving so much broader than just the department. Are you, you're yeah. talking about the um, position of, for trauma prevention that was in the secretary's office and then has been moved to DMH and that's actually <laughs> something that we would like to hear about in here, not, okay. not necessarily today but have greater depth uh, to understand the role that that <coughs> plays and then linkage with other prevention pieces, that'd be great. Yeah, no, we would love to talk about that. Good. I think the big news is also that we now have a partner for that person in the prevention world and it's our director of suicide prevention. Oh, so excellent. that was a role that was um, we put through last year um, yeah. and they were hired and they started last week and we are very excited. So you'll be welcome to meet them and talk about how maybe that role connects with uh, Kaya Anguli's role. Excellent. 
Someone to call, we've had a lot of efforts to bolster someone to call, 988 is probably the most public, and that was to bring more of a centralized, uh, we have this wonderful crisis system in Vermont where that's localized, but if you are just a regular person in Vermont, you may not have known that number, you may not know they exist. So 988 was a way to say, whoever you are, wherever you are in the state, if you are in a crisis or your child is in a crisis, here's a number to call. Um, that went live as a three-digit number in July, and we've had great success. Um, that's something we could talk more about and show data at another time. Um, but in addition to someone to call, we've got the Pathway Support Line and the Crisis Text Line. Someone to respond. This has been a piece where, obviously, staffing crisis has impacted. Um, but we've also been building over the past few years through stakeholder engagement, asking, we meet with families and say, what aren't you getting? How would you like your services to be received? And so many of them have said, we really want someone to come to us. Um, in my old job, I was a crisis clinician for kids. And when the parents would call me, if I had to say, well, you have to put them in a car and take them somewhere to get them to me, it was incredibly overwhelming for them. So this was them saying, we really want you to come to us. So we're building, you'll see a request for proposals that the department put out for mobile crisis response. And that's what this is. And it's also a benefit that um, we could tap into for Medicaid to get a higher reimbursement rate. Um, so that's something the state's really interested in building and sustaining. In terms of other someone to respond, obviously there's a great need to sustain and stabilize the designated agencies and special services agencies. So we have data on how much funding has gone out. And I think that's a, that's a very top of mind conversation for both of us on how we can make sure that if they're stable, then we have a less need for higher levels of care. Um, so that gets to someone to respond. And then lastly, somewhere to go. So um, you may have seen, and I'll just alert you to a few requests for proposals that the department has put out. One is for a youth inpatient facility. We have the Brattleboro Retreat. They're the only youth inpatient facility in the state. And we are one of our big initiatives and visions, and this is also coming from AHS, is integrated care, meaning that if you call and you're a human being and you have a mental health need, it's quite possible and likely you also might have a substance use need or a medical condition. And right now, with it being the only place to go for youth being a place that has no medical care, that's been a barrier to some youth being placed there. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to diversify and we're asking for a more integrated space for youth inpatient. Additionally, you'll see an RFP for, um, we're looking at community-based adult residential facilities. That's something we've been interested in. Um, we put out an RFI for that, so let me just clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, the RFP was for psychiatric urgent cares. So that's something that we're personally really excited about. It's a space in the community to go that's an alternative to an emergency department. Um, and we're very interested in the, the response we've gotten from across the state to stand mm -hmm. something like that up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then lastly, children's residential and micro residentials. Um, those are of great interest right now. We're talking about it with our partners at DCF um, and other departments to make sure that youth have a space to go if they reach a point where they really need something more intense. So hopefully, I know that was real quick. <laughs> that was um, great. We, great. You hit so many yeah. different things yeah. awesome. uh, on a lot of the issues that we hear about all the mm -hmm. time. So. Not sure. Uh, good. Um, so I do have a question, but I'm going to open it up for the three senators who are here. So we'll start with um, Senator Barack Gulick, and then we'll go to Senator Williams. And then Senator Weeks, if you have a question, and Thank I'll go last. Nice. I don't mind going last. Thank you very much. Um, this is great. Really, I would imagine that the um, hospital uh, workers, healthcare providers, are really happy to see um, kind of a focus on facilities, creating places for folks to go. Um, do you feel confident, or somewhat confident, that? If and when we're able to build um, and refine these structures, that we'll be able to staff them? And if not, is there a plan for staffing? Yeah, I, I would look at it as um, us needing to focus on staffing all of our levels of care. And so 
yes, we've targeted some inpatient or facilities, but we also have numerous openings throughout our um, system, and it takes all of those entities to be fully staffed to have the system be working uh, like a well-oiled machine. So. Um, we've done um, some great work uh, partnering with our designated agencies around community staff. I think Vermont as a state has um, plans um, and thoughts of how to bring workforce into um, the state as well as potentially utilize folks who may not be in the workforce yet. Um, and so those are all on our radar for uh, future planning to staff. So we understand that the you know there's a balance of growing programs and facilities, and we also want people to work in them and also get services in them. So I think there's a long road ahead to solve our workforce uh, crisis, um, and we're all on board to to figure out the best path forward for that. Thank you, Senator Wade. Kind of mental health issues, and this is local, so I've heard about it. Sure. Uh, we, we were invited to a medical um, society meeting, and the biggest theme of that meeting was uh, emergency room was overwhelmed with children mm. that have uh, mental health issues. They were filling up all the rooms in the, on the fifth floor of the hospital. Mm. Is there any plan to expand uh, treatment facilities uh, to the other parts of the state? Sure, do you want to talk a little bit? I think there's sort of different prongs. There's some maybe three prongs approach to supporting folks. Okay. Um, so we currently, uh, Deputy Prompt talked about um, investing in mobile crisis supports so that folks aren't having to necessarily go to the emergency room if they don't need to. So meeting people where they're at. Um, we also discussed our RFP for inpatient uh, psychiatric care. Uh, but then also, a Deputy Prompt has been leading some great work around alternatives to EDs, and you can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so those mental health urgent cares I spoke about before, some regions of the state are looking to um, develop them specifically for a population. So you'll hear the word PUC. Um, there's one down in Bennington. PUC means psychiatric urgent care for kids. And so the, there are some who are saying, you know what, we're gonna start with children and youth because for us, that's what's pushing the limits of our emergency departments. Mm -hmm. Others are using their data to say, mm, we actually think we're, we're in a decent place with youth, we're gonna start with adults. So that conversation, those conversations are happening. And thankfully, we've seen a lot of communication between hospitals and the community mental health to, to try to figure out how you can target those resources. I think it's stemmed from the COVID. Uh, but they were all alone. They were, you know, the medical staff was leaving. Mm -hmm. They had trouble getting nurses and yeah. emergency room techs. And I told them I'd address it. So. Yeah, you know, COVID exploited all of the things that um, I think needed to be exploited in, in a lot of ways. More people are acknowledging that uh, friends and neighbors are experiencing symptoms of mental illness and they're open mm -hmm. to talking about it. And, and people are also seeking treatment, and we want people to seek treatment, and treatment is available. Um, so I, yes, COVID is part of where we're at right now, and I can see that from a positive uh, and a negative um, side. Okay, thank you. Senator Weeks, did you have a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank uh, both of you for the overview. Uh, it's uh, very informative. Uh, I look forward to working with you over the future, but I have no additional questions. Thank you. Terrific. All right, thanks. Um, a, a question, but I think probably it'll be a time when you can come back and we can talk about the identification of the needs in the community. And I know that you work, but I don't know that you are, but I know the agency is looking at Act 167 and trying to understand what the needs are mm -hmm. and then where the services are. So are you working within the agency, with the agency? We're working closely with the agency on all initiatives. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, we don't need to. Do you work with higher ability at all? Oh, all through Dale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That That's a great program. They've done some great work over there. I know. Sure. Okay. Anyway, good. Thank you. Thank you. This, yeah. is, this as I told people, this is the tip of the iceberg. Mm, yeah. So you've just given us food for thought. Great. And we'd love to have you come back.
Yeah, we love yeah. them. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. It's a pleasure Thank you. Yeah, yeah, nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So now, now we can find uh, Dr. Chen and <laughs> Katerina. Right outside. I hope. And we'll you. try to scoot along, keep our time somewhat within the <laughs> We have, yeah, we take away time from us, okay. okay. Is this That's so mine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Chen, no, 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 yeah, yeah, we've got plenty of room now. I think we're we're we're, we're a quota of ten. Yeah. Okay, good, very good. And now I did share the um, presentation. Yes, did you, you're welcome to sit there, or you can sit over there. If you're going to be speaking, you want to stay over okay. there. Yeah, put it right up on the screen. I think Alex, you can. I can put the slides up. Okay, great. You to, We're going to skip some because we know we sent you yeah, a pretty long presentation. Have the control of it because then we'll know okay. Okay. If you have the Zoom information, I can let you in. Perfect. Oh, I see. I can do. We can do it for you. Yep. And then maybe abbreviated one so I can <laughs> keep up. You know, while you're getting started, um, I think we'll go around the table sure. and have the members of the committee introduce themselves. They don't know you, and you don't know them, probably, um, except me. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to start behind you with Senator Weeks. Uh, good morning to both of you. Uh, I'm Dave Weeks from Rutland County. I come from Proctor, and I apologize for not meeting you in person, but I, I went to bed last night uh, with a slight cold and woke up with a full-blown cold, so it's certainly not appropriate to be in the room today. But uh, thank you. It's good to meet you, Senator. Hi, I'm Martine larock Ulick. I live in Burlington, and I am a new senator from the Chittenden Central District. Great. Nice to meet you. I'm Terry Williams. I'm a new senator from Rutland. Oh, I'm from Great. I know you. I'm Senator Kitty Lyons. And Senator Ruth Hardy is out talking with um, someone, and she'll be back in, hopefully. She's off the left. For sure. OK. So thanks for being here and also being patient with our schedule. Um, we're getting used to legislative time all over again. Yes. So, um, we're looking oh, just for an overview of sure. TCF and then um, some of your priorities and, and where we'll be working together, because I know that's going to happen. Sure. Okay. So good morning, um, uh, Senator, Madam Chair, and Senator for the um, Health and Welfare Committee. Uh, certainly have a lot of ties. I live in Burlington. I spent 30 years at Rutland Regional Medical Center um, in the emergency department. And he was a great ED. I've seen he, he was a great ED. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I was a frequent flyer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, there's a lot of connections here. And so um, um, it's just Vermont, isn't it? Yes, it so, is. Um, and so um, I'm here with Katerina Lazayas, uh, my uh, uh, legislative Taskmaster. I like that name. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, and certainly she could be a resource to this committee uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, I'm delighted to present to you uh, what we're about in terms of the Department for Children and Family. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've got a cu couple things I want to just start with. Just you might numbers. want to just state your name oh, for the record. So, sure. So, I, I, so I forgot that. <laughs> yeah, I Dr. Know. Harry Chen, uh, uh, Interim Commissioner, Department for Child Children and Family. Um, and let's start off with our, <clears throat> with our mission. I'm moving too fast. I'm sorry. Okay, moving too fast. So just kind of some numbers to remember. Uh, we have 1,000 employees. We touch. Uh, uh, roughly 200,000 Vermonters a year, so that's almost one in three Vermonters. Uh, and uh, uh, we are all over the state, and it's really about reducing poverty um, and homelessness, improving the safety and well being of kids, creating permanent connections for children and youth, and, and financial assistance for um, uh, children, individuals, and families at a time of need. So you included that, the Reach Up program. Yeah, it's all there, it's all there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll go through some of that. Yeah, good. Our vision is a pl Vermont a place where, where people, kids, families are prosper, they're safe, have strong relationships, 
and individuals re re reach their uh, potential. Our mission is to foster healthy development and safety, well-being, and self-sufficiency for Vermonters. So I think it's always important to, you know, we're here to talk about the what, but I think it's also important to understand the why. And what we know is, you know, we, we traditionally talk about uh, health and well-being in terms of hospitals and doctors, uh, uh, but we also know that there are things called, we'll call them the social determinants of health. And these are the things that ultimately provide the foundation, uh, which I think we're very clear that um, how people thrive uh, and are healthier based on these social determinants, whether it's the house of your head, whether it's a job, uh, whether it's uh, a place for you to recreate, whether it's freedom from violence and racism, all those things uh, are, are vitally important to our health and welfare uh, of our populations. And we'll see uh, that we touch a lot of those in terms of the services we provide. Next. So here's just a brief overview again, the thousand employees, six divisions and offices across the state, uh, 200,000 Vermonters, there's family services, Makes sense, that's where we take care of kids and families. Uh, that's where uh, um, both in terms of uh, child safety, child welfare, uh, and uh, a, 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 an environment for kids that is conducive to development, permanency, and wherever possible, uh, 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 placement with their families. We have uh, Child Development Division, which is uh, all about the early child space in terms of child care, uh, in terms of um, early child education, in terms of early intervention services. I think all of those things are vitally important, obviously, for what happens later. Um, the Office of Child Support providing um, uh, uh, a program which helps uh, ensure that, uh, that kids and families get the support they need from, uh, from the non-custodial parents. Economic Services Division is our biggest division. That's with the LIHEAP, the, uh, the, the three squares, the housing, uh, uh, home uh, energy assistance, uh, and housing, emergency housing come from. The OEO, which is, a, uh, is really a, an agency which uh, primary purpose is to push out funds to other partner agencies. So it's the, the CAP agencies throughout the state. Um, it's a, a, a huge effort in terms of weatherization, uh, and it's, uh, um, it's working and partnering with all of our uh, homeless service agencies throughout the state. Um, Office of, uh, and then there's the Dis DDS, the Disability Determination Services, uh, which, which really uh, is a uh, our offshoot of the federal government. Uh, so it determines eligibility and re redetermines, recertifies uh, individuals who are applying for disability. So in terms of uh, the Family Services Division, it's, uh, it's actually our largest division. It has uh, 407 employees, and it's really fo it focuses on child safety and law abidance for children and youth and emerging adults. It's working with families, foster parents, partner organizations to achieve the best outcomes uh, we can for children and youth in our care and custody. Hi, I'm Senator Hardy. Sorry. That's okay. Um, uh, we try to keep, um, we foster, uh, we try to achieve a mission by working with families to keep youth, children and youth safe, to keep them free from harmful behaviors, and uh, understanding that sometimes that's not possible. We try to find um, uh, other safe, and, uh, and nurturing placements for them uh, while we work toward reunification, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, and then even in a smaller proportion, we know that sometimes that is not possible. Uh, and then we find, um, we search, find, and develop um, uh, placements that are permanent though, because we know permanency is really vital uh, to uh, uh, development uh, and uh, children uh, growing up to be successful uh, adults. So our uh, four e um, key outcomes, obviously safety comes first in terms of family services and our kids, permanence, finding the right place for them, uh, but to, uh, ideally return home, if not guardianship or uh, adoption, that we want to measure um, uh, and, and ensure that there's uh, well-being for our, uh, the kids in our custody and that uh, the youth, children and youth are free from unlawful behavior, just as a in terms of a number, there are probably 1,091 uh, children and youth that are in DCF custody right now. So and I tell I tell my kids I have how know, many of a those? thousand uh, other kids. Mm -hmm. How many of those are out of state? 
you know, or is it, that's a discreet question. I, yeah, that, that would be a yeah. question like that. What, what I can say is that most of the out-of-state ones would be in that kind of high-end system yes. of care. Yeah, they are. And that's probably maybe a, a, a hundred, hundred to 200 kids. Yeah. But some of them are here in the Vermont, but some of them are outside Vermont, too. And then one other question, because there's an interest in this committee on guardianship, and so how many of those kids are in some type of guardianship? But some we alternative have, kind yeah, of custody, yeah. which I guess we'll have yeah, to get we to can, that. Yeah, we can look that up. Yeah. Well, we're, we'll get to that, because I know we'll be talking about it at some point. Yeah. So in terms of our structure of the family services, it's district offices, there's statewide units in terms of child protection, and you know, in terms of residential licensing of, uh, of our uh, care facilities, and then there's a central office that oversees uh, um, uh, practices. Next is Child Development Division, uh, 49 employees. Um, again, uh, really uh, all about the early child space, all about uh, licensing, uh, about uh, uh, child care, uh, child early education, uh, licensing, uh, technical assistance, uh, early intervention with our uh, children's integrated services, trying uh, from birth to five, to try to again ensure that we get to them quickly and early, uh, uh, and, and to best ensure their success uh, onwards. Head Start collaboration, um, uh, universal uh, pre kindergarten uh, pre kindergarten oversight uh, with with the agency of education, uh, and. Again, all the, all the child care programs we serve, uh, uh, child care providers, understanding that Vermont is a, a, a very kind of diverse state in terms of the providers, um, the early professionals, early education and uh, after school professionals, and then families receiving what we'll call child care financial assistance, uh, and then families uh, served through children's integrated services. We have uh, multiple projects and programs through the uh, Child Development Division. See, we have our quality uh, um, quality program, uh, QS or STARS. We have our information system that really can, are able to track both the providers uh, uh, and the uh, 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 and the programs. We are uh, building capacity, uh, understanding. Uh, I think if nothing else, we saw during the pandemic uh, uh, what what happened uh, and how important in vital child care. Uh, and the early child system is. Uh, and then um, uh, understanding that most, we do not actually provide the child care, but we support the organizations that do. So it's technical assistance, both in terms of the business side, but also in terms of the professional development side. And it's, you know, it's licensing regulation um, uh, and a revision of that that's ongoing now. So important kind of the regulatory piece of that, but also the technical assistance piece of that. Um, um, and I won't go through this, but it's for your, just just to give you an example, we we spent or pushed out 108 million dollars um, um, to providers and and the system uh, in response to uh, the pandemic, understanding that the, really the needs that were. Well, there. it was important stabilization. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just look at that. One. It's all stabilization. I did look at right. this one yesterday as well. So, yeah. Yeah. so in terms of. Office of Child Support, our, our mission is really to, to uh, ensure the, promote the well-being of families by strengthening their financial safety net and, and uh, really making that link between non-custodial parents uh, and, uh, and ensuring uh, that, they, that they provide payment and support uh, for, their, for their children. And primarily, we, we know that the that, uh, receipt of child support increases independence of the parents, that it reduces child poverty, Reduces the reliance on public assistance. So there's a, you know, there's certainly a link between. Uh, um, uh, so as an example, sometimes the the payments will actually go up to economic services, uh, where where the family may receive benefits uh, to actually kind of repayment for those benefits. Reduced reliance on our benefits encourages parents to exit and remain off public assistance, and increases parental involvement of the paying parents. So it's really a way to keep kids connected with their family, but also support them financially. And in terms of um, ch ch Office of uh, Child Support, we, have, we serve the parents who are paying support. Uh, uh, we also uh, serve the guardians who are caring for children and the parents who are actually caring for kids. 
So there's just that kind of link in terms of providing, making sure that they get the support. Uh, there are all over 15,000 cases benefit, benefiting over 16,000 children. So you, you can see here that we work with our partners, economic services, family services, Department of Corrections, Department of Labor, employers, the judiciary, um, uh, domestic violence network, and um, um, associations of business and industry. So all of that is kind of connecting parents with families, with businesses, um, uh, creating mechanisms uh, where, whereby uh, we can ensure that the, the kids are getting the support that they uh, are due. And it's a difficult system to be in. It's what? It's a very difficult system to be in. Yes. 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 Yeah. Sure. Um, economic, economic services is, again, another very large uh, division of, um, of DCF. And it really it's, provides the economic benefits to Vermonters in need. So this is the safety net in terms of uh, families and individual Vermonters who may uh, be experiencing unemployment, um, single parenthood, aging, death of a family member or other life-changing events. Um, and there are, again, 350 staff throughout 12 district offices. Uh, we have a central office, and we have an um, economic service benefit call center, um, and then we have an application and uh, documenting process center. All of this um, uh, uh, connecting to Vermonters in need, those, uh, a lot of those 200,000 Vermonters are those receiving economic benefits. Um, and I think, truthfully, this is an area where we've seen a dramatic change in the way we work. Because it used to be pre-pandemic, you walk into the office, you sat down, you filled out a form. So now we're really seeing how, how that's changing, uh, uh, but also stressing the system. Because whereas before you could, you, could, you had people could wait in the waiting, waiting room, now they're waiting on Online. in the queue for the yeah. phones. Yeah. So understanding that we have challenges there, we have work to do mm -hmm. uh, to actually try to improve that. Uh, uh, the timeliness of our response. And the connectivity. And the connectivity, mm -hmm. yes. So economic services, um, and, you know, and, and, and all of, most of these are actually federal benefits. Um, and so uh, uh, the advantages, we're using federal dollars, the disadvantages, we actually have to go by federal rules. So mm -hmm. just as an example, we were thinking about changing, uh, uh, trying to use a call, you know, a contract to help us with our call center. Um, uh, but the federal rules say we have to wait 120 days to do that. So it's, not, it's you know, so it's as you might expect, it's the uh, the pace at which uh, the federal government accepts change it can be challenging. Mm -hmm. So the uh, benefit programs, everybody knows SNAP or Three Squares, which provides food um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, on the table for Vermonters. Uh, the general assistance uh, uh, program, which uh, helps. People's uh, individuals and family meet their basic needs, personal needs, housing, medical, dental, medical supplies, burial costs. Uh, um, the v Vermont Rental Assistance Program is part of the GA program in terms of short term rental subsidy. subsidy. LIHEAP, which actually, um, uh, as you might imagine, uh, people are worried about the cost of fuel to heat their homes. Uh, and this year we've got a, a couple bumps of, of funding, uh, which should help with that. And then reach up or TANF, which is um, uh, helps to stabilize families uh, experiencing poverty and to help them get out of uh, poverty. So again, uh, we had a lot of transitional uh, related, uh, uh, pandemic related programs, transition housing. I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about that. E pandemic EBT, the maximum allotment, which is actually going away based on the omnibus bill, would, and will be a challenge. So people will receive considerably less. Uh, in their SNAP benefits um, come March. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and also reach up rental assistance uh, was a, a, I think a program uh, trying to really address a certain population, which are families that are homeless, uh, trying to get them uh, uh, into permanent housing. OEO, uh, again, administers uh, grant funding, core funding for the um, uh, CAP agencies, the community action providers, uh, provides training and technical assistance, develop resources for communities. Um, a lot of the uh, next, the main areas really are homeless assistance. They support all of the homeless uh, uh, providers, service providers, uh, weatherization, financial empowerment, uh, and the core funding for the community action agencies. 
and again, I won't go through all this, but OEO uh, was able to push out tremendous uh, amount of money to their organizations. Again, they don't do the work. Um, uh, they're, I call them the small but mighty operation because um, they're really uh, focused on working with community partners, funding them, providing them the, the t technical assistance, and um, obviously the, um, making sure they're, they're held accountable. Um, for the dollars that go out. DDS, um, in short, uh, they provide applicants with medical eligibility in terms of uh, disability, uh, governed by Social Security and federal stat statutes. Um, it's a national, recognized as a national leader in terms of accuracy, timeliness, and public service. Again, they work for the um, uh, four federal program. We, we have to um, uh, abide by the federal rules, but we've uh, done that, uh, again, the very bottom line, 98.6% accuracy uh, in terms of those determinations. So we're very proud of the work that they do. So that's DCF in a whirlwind nutshell. I hope that <laughs> I'm sure we'll have So uh, we know everything we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know and, and in terms of priorities, I think we're um, you know, I, I think we're focused on uh, the end of the transitional housing program and how we um, transition um, the greatest number of miners to uh, uh, permanent housing that we can. Mm -hmm. Understanding that that I mean, that will not that's not a, a, a number that will be you know those that are left over obviously we also need to address uh, in in the most kind of uh, beneficial and humane way we can. So housing, um, fam, you know, the high-end system of care, the, the, the kids that are now, children and youth that are now going out of state, uh, certainly it, it is our preference to, um, where we can keep them in Vermont. Uh, I think additionally, uh, we're, this is not a, the, the, this system is struggling everywhere. And you know, I've talked to New Hampshire, yes. I've talked to Maine, yes. uh, everybody's really feeling the same pressure. So it's really a part of my, uh, major effort is to ensure that we're we're thinking ahead uh, in terms of the facilities and the programs that we need in terms of family services, and then economic services. I think I mentioned that the new way of doing business. Um, how do we best uh, 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 deal with that in terms of in, in an efficient manner? Yeah. yeah, good. Thank you. There's so much there, yeah. and then the linkage between judiciary and here yes. on some of these issues mm -hmm. just compounds everything but what and so we'll we're going to continue our interest uh, particularly where TPR might be in determination of yeah. rights and and guardianship and those things that are so really important they're um, important issues and they're yeah, you they know are. they're emotionally charged issues they're too. emotional issues yeah. senator thank you very much chair Lyons um, I was wondering, the number that you gave, the 1,091 um, children who were in D.C. or custody, how does that compare to the national average in terms of like per capita, you know? I, I, I would have definitely okay. That's Just a good question. Curious. I, yeah. believe, I believe we're actually a, above average mm -hmm. per capita, but we have made strides in the last few years to to be more aligned with the national average, but we can follow up. Okay, yeah, I think that'd be great. And then my other question was just, we have three folks here who are also on education. And so I was wondering, in terms of um, the departments, which ones work most closely with AOE? And I'm assuming it's CDD and FSD. Is that right? Yeah, I would definitely say- Definitely CDD. Yes, CDD. definitely yeah. CDD. Um, of course, there's overlap with FSD when a kid is in our right, care right. or may become in our mm -hmm. care. Um, ESD, of course, has overlap because, you know, in our reach-up program, that also serves families. Mm -hmm. And as well as the Three Squares program works very closely with AOE on the school meals programs and the various pandemic food assistance programs. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So I guess a lot. A lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I figured, yeah. We got time. We have two minutes. Go ahead, Senator. I, I thank you, Dr. Chen and, and Katarina. I'm sorry I was late. Um, uh, my, I know you can't provide specifics, but you did list this in your um, uh, priorities, and I'm wondering, will there be a, anything in the governor's budget or proposals about child care? Oh, I know and, that's and, one yeah, of our yeah. priorities. Yes, and, and I neglected to mention that obviously <laughs> there is a, related to 
um, what we saw during the pandemic. I think everyone acknowledges that there's um, stresses and challenges in the um, early child system. And so we're, um, there are quite a few uh, initiatives based on that uh, okay. uh, right. coming up. Well, we look forward to working yeah. with you guys on that. Thanks. Right, he did mention it before you came okay. in, but so it's good. And I'm glad you asked the question again, because it's nice to put a little exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, good work. Uh, any other questions? All right, Senator Thank Reyes. You, Just one question. I, I might have missed it. Do you have anything to do with the foster child care program? Yes. Yes. So that's Family Services Division. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a, obviously it's a very valuable resource in terms of being able to place uh, 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 children and youth in our custody um, mm -hmm. in a kind of safe nurturing environment, uh, hopefully temporarily, but um, but important nonetheless. We also have a very strong program with how youth transition out of foster care um, when they're aging out of the system mm -hmm. called the Youth Development Program. Um, and that's something that, similar to your question, Senator, about how it overlaps across the department is, you know, when a youth is in foster care for a, a big portion of their life, they're often um, using other programs at DCF as well. Right. Thank you. Okay. okay. This has been terrific. We will have you back and we'll dive deeper into some yes. of the um, departments because there's so much here in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to do that on the CCFAP uh, this week. Oh. And then yes, you know, get into uh, areas that are going to, we need a baseline to understand the work that is coming up in child care and other places. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And welcome you. to hey, great. new members. Welcome to you. Yeah. Good. Right. Right. Uh, Senator <laughs> Weeks, did you have a question? <laughs> I, I let you ask that. that. Yeah. No, 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 given the time constraints, no question. Certainly we'll follow up when we see. Um, um, we see this group again. Thank you. Uh, okay. oh, you've been too. Uh, thank you. I have to remember we've got a little hard. He's not very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Okay, so we have Monica White and um, Dale. Aha, uh -huh, I see. All right, we're we're behind schedule. Which is highly unusual in this building. <laughs> we do is that have sarcasm time. or what? <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing for people? Um, Jeff talked about there. One more. Yeah, we could do one more. He can come in. Welcome. Are you going to share up on the screen? I will, yeah. Uh, so I need to share my camera. I don't know. Have you given her the. Everybody should have the Everybody has the Zoom. Okay. Good morning. All right, I know it's awesome sauce. And. I can't remember where share screen is. Let's see. Oh. <laughs> we have we have it. We have what you've got. I think or you may have something. Breakout rooms? You know. <laughs> okay, okay, like, okay it's only been a few months since I've had to do this. Share screen, the big green button at the bottom. Here we go. <laughs> All right, you all ready? <laughs> well, the fluency because the state primarily uses Teams, so it's like it, oh, yeah. 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 But we I do the same so. thing when we get on Teams. So. Yeah. How does why, this why do they yeah. use Teams? <laughs> I do have. I'm getting used paper, to it. If anybody wants paper. Yeah, we do have it. I did. I, Alex did it well. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Yes, the doors are in color. Oh, so this is in color. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Beautiful. We don't, we don't use paper in here, but cases like this, it's important because we need to have this bottom floor or we can start mm -hmm. going up. All right, you can let me know when it's okay to hit the share button. All right, well, what, we're going to introduce ourselves first, and then I'll have you introduce yourself for the record, and then yeah. we'll move from there. So we'll start with Senator Weeks, who's behind you. Uh.
Uh, good morning. Uh, Dave Weeks from Rutland County. Uh, I live uh, in Proctor. I apologize for not being with you in person, but I went to bed last night not feeling well and, and woke up uh, feeling uh, pretty darn bad. So anyway, my apologies for not being in the room. But nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I hope you feel better soon. Yeah, definitely. Hello, I'm Martine LaRocky. I live in Burlington, and I am a new senator in the Chittenden Central District. Nice to meet you. Congratulations. Thank you. Hi, it's nice to see you guys. I'm uh, Senator Ruth Hardy from Madison District. Great to see you again, Senator. Senator Terry Williams from Rowan County, and I live in Polk. Nice to meet you. Senator Jenny Lyons, welcome. And I'm from Chittenden South East. And I see more of you on screen than in presence. <laughs> so this is great. Glad we're finally getting together. So why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself for the record, give us a little background on Dale, and, and then maybe some of the priorities and the issues that will be coming here, and we can work uh, with you um, on. Great. On so, which we can work with you. Use my correct grant. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, so for the record, my name is Monica White, and I'm the commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, also known as Dale. Um, and I am joined today by my principal assistant, or our principal assistant, not my personal principal assistant, uh, Rebecca Silbernagel, um, who is also our legislative liaison. Um, so in terms of timing, I plan the uh, presentation that we have is very, very robust, and I won't have enough time to go through that in detail. But my intent was to just kind of skim through and, and do an overview of the, of the high level points, um, orientation for the new uh, senators, um, and refreshing for the, for the two of you who've, um, who've been here. Um, for, been here in the Senate for a bit. So, um, would you mind firing that up, Rebecca? Fire, firing away here. Okay. All right, there we go. Um, so the, the mission of the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living is to make Vermont the best state in which to grow old or to live with a disability with dignity, respect, and independence. And that really permeates everything we do across our five divisions, across the commissioner's office. Um, we have, um, it, well, next slide, please. Maybe I'll just kind of put it down. Just page down. Okay, there we go. All right, we'll get it. Yeah, here. Right. So, um, and so the mission is that's what we do um, as a department, but it really is um, a statewide priority. I, I think for all of us, um, and I I know for all of us to really um, fulfill the commitment that we have made as a state um, to persons with disabilities and to older Vermonters, enabling folks to receive supports and services that they need um, in their home to support living independently um, and fully included as members of their communities. Um, Vermont is a leader uh, across an, any number of metrics as it pertains to uh, older Vermonters aging well, as it pertains to persons with disabilities, persons with developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, um, uh, employment for persons with disabilities, and that sort of thing. And that's you know something that we are um, very proud of, recognizing that especially post-pandemic, there's um, some work to do to really um, stabilize and strengthen our systems of care um, generally across the board. Um, on this slide too, I'm not going to go through them, but um, the, the commitment that we um, all as a state have made is um, governed by a number of state and federal mandates um, to include the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, the Developmental Disabilities Act here in Vermont, Older Vermonters Act, um, and Nationally Older Americans Act, and, and so on. So I'm not going to go into great level of detail in the interest of being crisp. Uh, next slide, yeah. please. I'm gonna use mine. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so that's kind of the the very broad spectrum of um, our department's um, uh, goals and, and targets. But for our department itself, we have about 300 employees, um, and those folks are statewide. Um, we have about a third of our staff headquartered in Waterbury at the state office complex, and then the remainder across our 12 district offices. Um, and um, also home-based and pre-pandemic pre home-based um, performing functions out um, in the community to include adult protective services and um, survey and certification 
uh, among other things. So that's kind of who we are uh, in terms of numbers and, and where we are statewide. Um, we have about uh, a little, we have over a half a billion dollars in our budget across all of our programs. Um, and um, I'm not going to, to break into the specifics on, on this slide here in the interest of time. Um, but our, so we have the, our commissioner's office and our work is um, comprised or, or split between five divisions. And I would like to spend a bit of time just orienting to kind of the, the high level where um, the programs sit in the divisions and, and what those are at the very um, high level. Um, and so our, our five divisions are our adult services division, developmental disability services division, Division of Licensing and Protection, Higher Ability Vermont, which in statute is known as Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. We underwent a rebranding initiative last year um, to support um, like a, a, a fresher, crisper, and more relatable name. Um, so we refer to that division as, as Higher Ability. Are you interested in having that statutory change? Um, you know, I'm not sure that that's something that we have contemplated, um, given that there are uh, federal regulations with the federal... Um, so it's better to keep it as appropriate. I think so, okay. but that's something we could certainly talk to, to yeah, make no, sure. And, and then the, the, the sort of the criteria and principles that are under higher ability, because I know how successful it is right now. Mm -hmm. It's been really terrific. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, uh, and then on the division for the blind and visually impaired. So those are our five divisions, and um, in the next slides we'll do just a bit of orientation to, to those divisions. Um, actually, if you can go back up to the next one, please. Thank you. So commissioner's office, um, this is the kind of who's who at a really high level um, in the commissioner's office. You can expect to see uh, and hear from most of the, the folks who are listed here. Um, depending on testimony topic um, and um, at any time that there's a question or issue or needing more information, uh, certainly reach out to myself, uh, Deputy Commissioner Megan Turney Ward, Rebecca as our legislative liaison, um, and, uh, and other folks here um, kind of helmed within the Commissioner's office. Next slide, please. All right. So uh, getting into the division, so the adult services division, um, the division director is Angela smith Jang. Um, she's been in that role for a few years and is just um, absolutely a fantastic champion for the work that occurs within ASD as it's, as it's known. Um, and ASD's primary focus is managing long-term services and supports for adults with physical disabilities and older Vermonters. Uh, there are 43 staff in that division, um, and, and the scope of, of that focus includes um, several units. So long-term services and supports unit, um, also known as overseeing the Choices for Care Medicaid program, um, which provides uh, Medicaid services for um, folks who are nursing home level of care in the setting of their choice, um, either in a long-term care facility or at home and in the community. Um, and also the brain injury program is, is, is housed uh, here as well. Um, our quality management unit, which um, provides a, a quality oversight function for um, adult services programs. Uh, state unit on aging um, works to works um, in concert with um, the five area agencies on aging around the state um, and other partners um, on a number of um, issues focusing on older Vermonters um, and to include the Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well um, work on that front and that's something that is um, also uh, in strong partnership with the Vermont Department of Health um, on a number of metrics there. And we also have the Money Follows the Person Project, which is um, an initiative uh, granted by the federal government focusing on helping um, individuals who wish to um, transfer their care from a skilled nursing facility into the home to help tackle some barriers um, on that front. And the next slide um, lists some of the priorities within the Adult Services Division. Um, 
in the, I'm just, I'm not sure how much time I have and how in depth you want to go because I do have other yeah, take divisions. another 10 minutes or so. Yeah, be good. Okay. Um, all right. So um, the, the priorities as listed here, I think I, I spoke to some of them. Um, briefly, but conflict of interest in case management. Um, Vermont um, has not been in compliance with federal um, requirements with regard to um, having conflict of interest in case management for home and community based services, and that is a priority at the agency level across all of the programs to include um, those helmed within adult services and our developmental disability services as well. Um, also development development of quality measures um, in alignment with federal uh, regulations and the renewal of the global commitment waiver um, which occurred this past um, summer um, workforce 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 and providers <laughs> we haven't heard that before <laughs> haven't heard that that's news new news right <laughs> right so so that is a um, significant issue um, our state plan on aging we actually just renewed um, in October for a three-year um, period for um, a, a state unit on aging and and the focus on that front I, I won't um, dive down that here, but that's a significant body of work. Um, and uh, the Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well, I, I mentioned that previously. Um, money follows the person. Um, and also um, maximizing the use of one time um, ARPA, I can't now, for life of me, I can't remember that acronym, federal but funds. the federal <laughs> funds. The, <laughs> yes, the enhanced funds that came to us through COVID um, specifically for home and community based services um, as enhanced um, enhanced funding opportunities at the agency level, um, you know, maximizing the use of those strategically um, to best impact the life, lives of Vermonters. Uh, next slide, thank you. And we'll, we're going to define FMAP in here fairly soon. Okay. Let me do that. <laughs> That's it. <an answer. laughs> right. Okay, excuse me. Um, so, Developmental Disability Services Division. So, the division director is Jennifer Garabedian. Um, she's been in this role for about a year and um, is fabulous. I'm sure she will be um, in this committee at, at some point this session. Um, and the primary focus of DDSD, as it's known, is um, managing home and community based services for Vermonters with intellectual and developmental disabilities and providing court appointed public guardianship services. Um, uh, 51 staff through that division um, in uh, three primary buckets. Um, the program specialist team to include um, a uh, inclusive but not um, exclusive to uh, focus on, we have a position for children's services, um, public safety, um, and um, geographic uh, units there. Um, similar to the adult uh, services division, we have a quality management unit focused on developmental disabilities, services quality, and our office of public guardian uh, providing public guardianship services to about 750 folks across the state. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, the priorities here um, align greatly with ASD in um, conflict of interest and case management, quality measure development. Um, uh, one focus for DDSD in, in particular is the crisis continuum of care, um, expansion of clinical support. So um, finding that um, the clinical acuity level of um, folks in crisis in developmental services is um, has reached a, a point that we have this sort of unprecedented. So focusing some um, energy on that front to Im improve that um, segment of that system of care. Again, workforce provider stability. Um, last year, uh, H720-Act 186 was passed, and that was really landmark legislation for persons with developmental disabilities. Um, and uh, la landmark, I'll just put it, put it that way. Um, and um, part of that was um, inclusion of a limited service position, which we have filled, um, and uh, creation of a um, 
focus uh, advisory committee on developing residential alternatives or housing model pilots for persons with developmental disabilities, recognizing we've heard loud and clear that the current um, housing options in the system are um, not meeting the needs of everyone. So what would be better? What are those options um, to consider? And so um, H720 put in place that the framework with which to um, develop pilots so we can evaluate data and really make some decisions as a system for what we will have moving forward. I and think that, work that, is will, underway. Yeah, that, that bill was actually fun to work on. I know there was a lot of controversy behind it and around it and everything else, but um, the outcomes, we would, we would love to hear what the outcomes are and the direction you're going with pilots and how that's all mm -hmm. sorted out. Great. Yeah, and we're we're happy to um, we're happy to come in. Um, we'll actually be at House Human Services tomorrow with with an update on yes. on that, um, yes, and I happy know. to come in for a, a larger targeted discussion of this group. Yeah, too. and that's part of the bill. They have the bill, the same bill that we have. So we'll we'll maybe have some replication of the information they mm -hmm. are taking there. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Um, and then um, we are also, we have worked over the past uh, couple of years to roll out a standardized independently administered assessment tool, um, SIS-A. Uh, payment reform is, um, is a focus as well as, um, and it's not on the slide, but we recently um, implemented a new um, statewide system of care plan for developmental services as of January 1st. And some of the priorities included in that include um, a mindful focus on um, supported decision making and um, ombud support for persons with intellectual or developmental disabilities. All right, so Division of Licensing and Protection, also known as DLP. Um, a division director is Joe Nussbaum. Um, you absolutely will be um, hearing from and, and seeing Joe this um, this year. Um, to jump ahead, one of our uh, large priorities this year is an update to the Adult Protective Services um, statute, which is decades old at this point. Um, and so uh, Joe has been leading that effort. So um, I'm getting, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> I'm just okay. really excited about that. <laughs> That's great. We, we like updating. Yes, yes. Um, and so, uh, so DLP's primary focus is uh, protective services for, for Vermonters. And um, the scope is 54 staff um, statewide, um, comprised of the Survey and Certification Unit, who uh, provides regulatory um, compliance um, and licensure for um, over 200 licensed long-term care facilities, hospitals, home health agencies. Um, and so that, that sphere of work Work, um, adult Protective Services, who investigate reports of abuse, neglect, or exploitation of vulnerable adults. Um, restorative Justice Services, which is a relatively new pilot um, to gauge um, engaging um, alleged uh, victims and perpetrators in a restorative justice process for successful resolution of, um, of APS uh, matters. Um, service navigators, also a relatively new pilot where we have um, folks embedded within Adult Protective Services that um, can help to make some connections for um, some really thorny situations for, for reports that come in that might not meet the statutory definition of abuse, neglect, or exploitation, or the person might not be a um, meet the definition of victim in, in statute, but they need services and they really have been a dyna dy dynamite resource to be able to, to connect to community resources that will help in those situations. Um, and also, uh, we have two limited service positions uh, known as the COVID strike team. Um, we, Dale, took a, a very outsized role in the, the heat of the pandemic, particularly given the focus of um, preventing COVID-19 in long-term care facility settings um, and a significant body of work reallocating people from their normal day jobs um, to, to focus on that. 
and coming into um, the you know endemic phase, realizing that COVID hasn't gone away and we still do need to support long-term care facilities, we were able to leverage some grant um, funding through the Department of Health to fund two positions to continue that work so that um, it's, it's in supporting our partners um, at long-term care facilities and, and others with COVID-specific um, supports. So uh, next slide is the priorities for DLP. As I mentioned in my site, state of great excitement, um, the uh, update to the APS statute, um, and very grateful um, to uh, Senator Lyons, among others, for support of um, support of this work, and my understanding that, that is currently being worked on the Ledge Council. Yeah, we're going to get the bill in here, and it's going to be there. So we're going to then we're going to discuss who takes that first. That's going to be an interesting type of war. But, see, everybody <laughs> wants to do it. So that's good news. That's good news. Right, and that is you know so and everybody. Sorry, I think that you know as a, a reasonably fair assessment because we had a very. Um, a robust group of, of stakeholders involved uh, through the APS subcommittee, and uh, it's universally understood that the, the statute, as, as currently written, is um, woefully out of date for today's world. So that's great. Um, we uh, also, last year, um, it, we received additional positions. I four or five, um, I'm drawing a, a blank on the, the number right now, but positions for survey certification um, to enable us to provide annual um, uh, surveys at state licensed facilities. So um, in the long-term care facility world, skilled nursing facilities are governed by federal regulations and requirements through the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, whereas state licensed facilities to include assisted living residences, residential care homes, and therapeutic community residences are governed through state regulation. And so um, the resources we had did not enable us to get out on an annual basis to state licensed facilities until last year when we were able to get uh, some additional positions through that. And we, I believe, now are um, almost have almost all of those positions filled and prioritizing getting those people onboarded and trained and boots on the ground um, out there to do that work. Um, again, uh, some pilot um, funding on the restorative justice. Um, project is is a priority um, finalizing update on state survey regulations um, to uh, specifically for the state licensed facilities um, working to focus um, on adult protective services substantiation rate and um, that is uh, uh, sorry I lost my space here um, and then uh, we submitted a uh, legislative report over the summer on self-neglect as a problem, um, so focusing on self-neglect, and then the strike team positions continuing, continuing those work, that work. Hireability um, Vermont, as, as mentioned previously, um, Diane Donos is the director of that division, um, and focusing on helping Vermonters with disabilities to prepare for, obtain, and maintain meaningful careers um, and helping employers recruit, train, and retain and promote employees with disabilities. Um, and so, you know, that's an important point. It's maintaining meaningful careers. It's not just, you know, get a job. It's working with each individual person to learn um, strengths, learn what folks want to do, um, what are their educational goals, cred credential attainment, that sort of thing. Um, to uh, really help put people on a, on a, the track that they want and will be successful in. Um, and there are about 145 staff across the state um, focusing on um, career counseling, um, so working with folks, um, working with employers in the area is a big focus, um, providing assistive technology support for um, folks who need a, a device or a gizmo or a gadget or some really, really great equipment to help folks be more um, uh, able to um, live and live and work successfully. Um, and we also, within higher ability, uh, have our, the uh, Invest EAP Employee Assistance Program, which is uh, statewide. 
and priorities for uh, this division include the Vermont Career Advancement Project, a relatively new initiative. Um, we've now had two years worth of a summer career exploration program born out of the pandemic that has been uh, extraordinarily successful and powerful in um, working with high school youth who have a disability and want to um, do a deep dive on, on career and educational focus, including paid internships, um, and it's, it's really just remarkable work. Um, and uh, we also are working on a pilot, also born out of last year, legislation last year, on um, employment supports for, uh, with, for persons with uh, substance use, um, it, opioid focus. Um, we're also really targeting um, efforts on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access uh, to ensure that we are truly um, walking that walk for all Vermonters um, and performance management of, of how can we do things better. And our last but not least division is for the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, directed by Fred Jones, um, who uh, focuses on much of the same as Higher Ability Vermont um, and uh, for specifically for persons who are blind or visually impaired. Um, it's our smallest division with uh, 11 employees and um, the, the services listed here, vision, rehabilitation, employment, high school transition services, assistive technology, um, business enterprise program, and older blind program are, are different than um, higher ability, but um, I'm realizing that I'm being very, uh, so I'm trying to talk very fast. That's okay, we're pretty okay. clear up there. Okay. We're getting it, okay. we're getting it. All right, good. Um, and then if you uh, pass the next one, please. Um, so priorities, the um, expand the LEAP program, and that is the Learn, Earn, and Prosper program to include apprenticeship opportunities. That is a fabulous partnership um, with uh, that provides some fantastic opportunities to youth and um, college, high school students, college students um, who are blind or visually impaired over the uh, summer. Um, there's networking, there's education. It's just, uh, I've done some in-person um, days with, with folks and it's really, really fantastic work. Um, getting a uh, consumer-driven conference off the ground, um, specifically as it pertains to blindness-related assisted devices. Um, it, the, the technology is incredible, what is out there, and, and making the connection for people who are blind or visually impaired to the, the, the incredible amount of technology that's out there to, to actually make that difference is a big focus for us. And also uh, a targeted focus on uh, persons who are deaf blind, so who um, have, are both you know, deaf and um, blind, really um, drilling down to focus on um, the needs of that population. It's, it, it's small, but it's important. So. Um, so I think that is the end. That's a lot of me talking, um, and I'm uh, really excited about uh, the work that we have underway and the work that is yet. Uh, to, to do and, and working with you this session. That's terrific, thank you. I, I think what we'll do is we're gonna hold our questions if there, someone has a question, need further information, maybe just send it along, so okay to send it to the two and then. Will you come back in or, or member, members of your, um, uh, of Dale come in and we start diving into bills, we'll, we'll get more yeah. info. Really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, and again, congratulations on your elections or re-election as re elections as the case may be. Um, looking forward to being back, and um, I hope you enjoy this sunny but really cold day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have yeah, to sunny. It's healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, takes away sad. Right. That's right. Season one affected the weather. It's great. Thank, thank you very much. Okay.